He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. Mighty hero. Yeah. The Lord is with you. That is what the Lord of hosts said to Gideon when he was hiding in shame. <laughs> Had his face covered behind a wine press, hiding in shame from his enemies, looking at the situation, the circumstances, and basically saying it's hopeless. What are we going to do? So atypical God to show up in your whiny, hopeless, terrible, perceived, uh, impossible situation and say, hey, you're the hero. And I cannot tell you how many times there's been something that's pricked my heart from the Lord, and I've always been like, right, who are you talking to? Who, is it Kay? Who, who are you talking to? But look at these situations in the Bible over and over where God just shows up in people's lives, and he says, okay, you're going to do this. And they're like, you who? You, you. <laughs> and, and so it's a normal thing for us to be like, well, not me. In fact, I honestly think that that's one of the most healthy responses that we could ever have with God. Not me. And he's like, yeah, not you, me in you. Right. You, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> me. <laughs> well, there goes all the seeker sensitive people. See, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Church down the road. You in, the, Paul said it this way, there is nothing good in me that is in my flesh. You in your flesh stinketh. That's what, that's what Mary told Jesus when he went to raise Lazarus from the dead. He said, Lord, he stinketh. And the Lord's like, and? I can deal with that. In fact, the more you're dead, the more you stinketh, the more the Lord can deal with it. It's when, it's when we think we're awesome. Right. I got all that. You know, God definitely got an increase in his kingdom when I came along. <laughs> and there's people that think that. They'd never say that. They'd never be all arrogant faced like I just was. But there's people on the inside that think, you know, this church is going to be a lot better since I'm here. Right. You know, if Pastor Steve knew what I was. <laughs> He'd probably utilize me more. <laughs> Might be a reason you're not being utilized. We'll move on. Psalm chapter 16, verse 3. This is one of my faves. The godly people in the land, they are my, this is God speaking, they are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. I want to highlight the godly people in the land. God puts you in the land that you need to be. If you think that you accidentally stumbled in here today, you were just bored on a Sunday and drove by here and decided to cop a squat, then you don't recognize what the Lord is trying to divinely do in your life and in this region. He, God places people where he needs them. Remember, we're the body of Christ. I, one of the reasons I believe, I know that the Lord has not returned is because the bride, the body of Christ, that's supposed to be beautiful and, and without spot, without wrinkle, this, this glorious royal bride, because of how she is right now, she's got an, like an arm sticking out of her head. I want to be the arm up here. You can't be down here. No, I want to be up here. Four fingers have taken off because I don't like this church. 
out of here. I'm going to go find me another church. And then you got one church with 12 fingers and one church with eight. And you got just, just be who you're called to be. Be where you're called to be it. Fit into your body part. Operate in unity. Let the blood flow. Let everything you do for others as you'd have them do for you. These are very simple concepts. But we have, we've changed Christianity into a consumer-friendly requirement, placed demand, placing demands not only on the Lord, but on his people. If you don't perform, Craigers, if you don't perform the way I want you to perform, you're out of here, buddy. I mean, I might still go to church with you, but you're going to get to stink eye. I'll give you a hug because I got to. That's what they do around here. Dang it. But I ain't going to mean it. <laughs> that, that is not what God desired to produce in Jude. Uh, there's two references to Jude. In Jude, he literally says that people like that are spots on your feasts of love. The world literally should look and say, man, that church is so weird. They love each other. They hug each other. I've seen the pastor kissing people. Weird, cult, crazy. Kingdom, normal. That's why, that's why some people squirm at it like, uh, okay, I'll take a hug. You see that? He almost got through me. It's all right. You keep coming. We'll keep going. The people in the land, the land that he places them. And notice, they are my true heroes. You are his possession. You belong to him. And if he calls you a hero, how dare you call yourself anything else? That is, if you call him Lord, if you call him Lord, then what he says is the way it is. Colossians 1.27, this is kind of the foundation verse for this. And I've scratched out you Gentiles and I've put in my own version. So I got the Steve Castle revised amplified version that says God did this because he wanted you beloved. You that are greatly loved, you beloved to understand his wonderful and glorious mystery. A mystery, because there's many more mysteries that he wants to show you. This is a big one now. And that mystery is that Christ lives in you. His resurrection wasn't to just show off, even though he showed off. It wasn't just to finish the, the whooping of the tail of the satanic entities, all the fallen entities, all, all the things that are contrary to the kingdom of God. It wasn't just to show off that he whooped them hands down, kicked their butts all over hell in an Apec Duo My parade. Go watch that one in King and Kingdom series called The Parade. It's on Rumble. Yeah, that's right. They took it off a... <laughs> One day, YouTube, you're going to get yours. Go on Rumble and watch in the Kingdom, King and Kingdom series the message called The Parade. And you will see the display that Jesus put the enemy, Satan, and all of his little greasy minions... He drug them in a massive parade of victory. But that wasn't the point. The point of the gospel wasn't to show off. The point of the gospel, the point of the resurrection wasn't to show off. The point of the resurrection wasn't to just beat the devil. The point of the resurrection was to get his resurrection life into you. Jesus didn't need to show off. He was king. He was Lord of heaven and earth. He was already the most high. You don't get more high than the most high. He was already in charge of everything. 
He was already God. Just, just so you know, God is like the top. He, he didn't do any of that for him. He didn't need the accolades. He, he don't need you to run around saying his name because it makes him feel better and it gives him warm fuzzies. Oh, did you hear how they said my name? <gasps> Father. <laughs> he wanted to get it into you. He's the least self-centered person that has ever existed. Which is why some of us just don't get it. Because we're so... It's, it's, I call it, it's meistic. We're, we're meistic. Like everybody filters through what's going on in their life based upon you. Like, how does this affect me? How does this affect my money? How does this affect my time? How does this affect my emotions? How does this affect my life? How does this affect, who cares? That was the life I used to live. I actually came to Jesus and I said, hey, my life stinks. I need someone to fix it. And Jesus said, okay, I'll kill you. Well, that don't sound awesome and fun and warm fuzzy, but if that's what you say, it's the only thing we can do. There's no extreme home makeover we can do with this. You've wrecked this house beyond repair. We need to condemn it, knock it down, burn it to the ground, nuke the hole, take the whole thing, throw it into another planet past Pluto. Okay, Lord, you, I trust you. <laughs> You're God. And then he gives you this beautiful Christ life. And the whole time you're like, why did I hang on to that old thing so long? Amen. That thing stunk, terrible, self-centered. And he's like, okay, now go live for me. Me who? Me, me? No, me, you. Okay, well, let's start that process. And just so you know, if you haven't started that process, that's a fun one too. <laughs> Thinking about other people more than yourself. <laughs> and not just the people you like. <laughs> Because that's easy. The, the people that you don't. Amen. I'm looking to see who's looking at me like exercising their faith. I will, like Steve Castle. <laughs> and that mystery is that Christ lives in you and he is your hope of sharing in God's glory. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into some of the exegesis on understanding how the spirit realm works because the spirit realm is more real than the realm you're sitting in. Amen. God's more real than that chair because yep. God made the chair. Amen. The things that are happening right now in the unseen realm, the spiritual realm, are more real than what's happening right here because some of your emotions, they ain't real. They just come and go based upon how good your breakfast was. If you're sugared up or if you're not. If you got good sleep or you didn't. If your body hurts or it don't, all of those things will affect your reality that is nowhere near reality because what's happening in the spirit world is the real real and this is a reflection of the real. And I'm telling you that probably 80% of all of Christians in America for sure don't have a clue what I just said because they think the spirit world is like woo and and Ghostbusters and, and fakey, fakey Hollywood. One of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I had a, a, a theology um, person that I know who was, uh, he's a scholar and a, and a professor, and he was, they asked him to come to this very uh, spiritually dead scholarly Convention. They, they wanted him to, to speak at this thing. And this is filled with some of the most spiritually dead theological people that you would ever meet. Like actual teach in dead seminaries and who are not born again, who don't have a lick of Christianity in them, but they know how to interpret the Bible and understand uh, the language of Scripture. And so they obviously get promoted. Just like in anybody in any other business, y'all, don't think that every doctor that's out there and every nurse is out there that actually cares for people. Right? right? right. No. They took the Hippocratic Oath and lied the whole time. Yep. You know it. 
So don't think that it's any different in like a seminary or in a church. You know, don't think every pastor, just because there's pastor in front of his name, that he just loves the sheep. <laughs> Some of them would love to beat you until you just hand over your money and your accolades. Amen. And this guy is a, he believes, he actually has written some really powerful stuff on the supernatural, on, on the spiritual realm. And so he was at this conference, and before he talked, there was another lady that got up to speak, and she was from Africa. And so she started off by saying uh, something about the supernatural, the spiritual world. And you could, like, hear the, the oxygen get shucked, uh, sucked out of the room because nobody in this room, thousands of, of these, these awesome with... PhD, THD, you know, more letters on the end of their name than I got letters in my name. But they're all spiritually dead. And she starts talking about the supernatural realm. And so you could tell, she became very aware in this room. She said, look, I know I'm in America. She goes, it would do you all well to leave America and go see the rest of the world because in the place that I live, in Africa, while we're studying the scriptures and we go down to the store to buy a gallon of milk, we have to deal with demon-possessed people and cast the demons out of them. In America, you don't either, A, you don't deal with the demon-possessed people or you give them a pill. We have to deal with them because they might try to kill us and we don't have pills. So we actually have to engage with the supernatural realm, with the spiritual realm. In America, you don't have to. We'll just send you into a padded room and say that you've lost your mind. Yeah, because you're a flesh puppet. Right. Some demon has taken over your life. And instead of us, the church, doing what we need to do, which is engage with the spiritual world, understand that we are from a spiritual world, we're headed back to a spiritual world, and until we get there, we need to deal with this world based upon the world that we came from. Right. We're going to continually be surrounded by people that are afflicted by spiritual reality but nobody to rescue them. More than half of the times that Jesus healed someone in scriptures, it was by casting demons out. More than half. And I'll guarantee you there's a ton of people in here. Well, I don't know about a ton. I don't know how many of you have actually laid hands on the sick and declared over them that they get healed. But let's say it's half this church, which would bless my heart. <laughs> and let's say you've actually seen people recover, which I'm going to stick with my 50%. You lay hands on the sick, Jesus said they'll recover. But I'll guarantee of that 50%, that there's probably maybe 5% of the 50% that has actually dealt with demonic or spiritual forces. And we are a good church, y'all. That just speaks to us the fact that we really think that this whole world just kind of works by the psychological energy or physics. And every once in a while, there's a little bitty weirdy spiritual thing, and you're just kind of like, eh, I don't know, maybe that was spiritual. And that is absolutely not true. The kingdom of God is invading this world so that it can take out the kingdom of darkness. There is an invasion taking place right now. There is all kinds of spiritual activity that if your eyes were opened right now, we'd probably have to raise you from the dead. That's how much is going on in his room. There are demons in his room. There are spiritual entities in his room. All kinds of stuff going on. There's angels. Amen. We know Christ is here. I brought him for sure. I don't know about you, but I brought him. He just, I just read Christ in me. That's the mystery. Ha ha. Take that devil. Christ in me. I'm going to move on. <laughs> I was about to get old. I'm going to move on. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. And I'm doing this in the NLT. And I, let me say this real quick. Oh, 
If you would like a copy of this message, my notes, because uh, I'm going to get into some deep places. I put a couple of them back there by Mitchell. Um, if there's not enough, I'll keep printing more. So if, you'd, if you're, you're fine going back there and grabbing one, you won't bother me if you want to go grab one. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through how this works. And the reason I'm using the NLT is not because I am a big fan of the NLT version. I do not, I honestly don't like the NIV or the NLT. I, I believe that they are, um, they are subpar translations. But every translation has flaws. This is really important. I've had so many people come up to me, it's like, do you preach from the King James? Here we go. Because <laughs> there's an entire movement called King James only. It, it's an actual like mini internal denomination. So here's, here's what I'll tell you. I love the King James. That's the Bible that sits on my desk. I study the most out of the King James because it was the Bible that I read when I was a kid. I, I've, I've memorized half the Bible in my head in King James. I also, another reason I like the King James is because it uses antiquated language. And because it uses antiquated language, it makes you look up the words and the meanings because it's antiquated. Amen. And so it forces you to study. So that's my attraction to the King James. But I don't believe that Jesus walked around Galilee saying, Thou shalt goeth hither. He, he did not. King James is not what Jesus spoke. It is not the most, it's not the authorized from heaven. It's the authorized for King James, but he ain't God, just so you know. Yeah. In fact, I, one, time, one time I had a guy charge me up at a, like, you were using other versions. You should have been using a King James. I said, so you, you believe that King James is the version? Absolutely. King James is the version. Do you know that the Apocrypha was in the 1611 King James authorized version? And he kind of just stared at me because usually people are ignorant. I didn't say stupid. Ignorant. Stupid is you're choosing. Ignorant is you don't have information. And he's like, well, what's the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is part of the scriptures that only Catholicism believes is canonized and has some really funky stuff in it. This is the reason that we don't have it canonized. And so the original version of the Bible, in order to capitulatory throw a little bone to the Catholics, put in the Apocrypha. So the 1611 authorized King James Version has the Apocrypha in it. So if you're King James only and you believe that's what God spoke, well, then you better start reading the Apocrypha and you're going to have a huge problem at Beloved Church because we don't believe some of that stuff. Or you can just recognize that nearly every version of the Bible was somebody's attempt and I honestly believe righteous attempt to bring the scriptures out in clarity. There are some that I think do a, a better job than others. There are some that I think do a terrible job. So when I'm going through this and I study, most of my study is done in the interlinear. Those are the, the guys in the room. You probably, uh, if you've been to any of the men's stuff, you, you, we use the interlinear very often in our men's uh, breakfasts, our men's gatherings. Doc Ryan did it for us at camp. And we've been, they've been doing a pretty good job of it. I've been using the interlinear for 15 years. The interlinear is the original Greek, and then you can look every word up. And you have to do all kinds of study to figure out exactly what they were saying. Understand this, the Bible was not written to you. It was written for you. And if you don't get that, if you don't think like the intended receiver, you won't get what they get. Let me give you an example. There's a bunch of idioms in the Bible. This is, an idiom is something that a culture or a society embraces, a way of saying something that is unique to that culture or society. Like if I said, man, the other day uh, I was with this guy and he was so full of it that I finally just said, your pants are on fire. Everybody in here knows exactly what I'm saying. But if you read that a hundred years from now and you did all the research on fired up pants 
and you did all the research on, on full of it, you would never conclude what everybody in this room just heard me say. You heard me say that he was a, a really good liar. He was so full of lies that I was overwhelmed by it. You would never get that 100 years from now unless you understood the culture and the society that used the idiom, liar, liar, pants on fire, and you're full of it. This is why it's important to understand the scriptures the way they were intended to be written. This will help a bunch of people if you, if you drill down. This will take all of this anti-woman anti aspects out of the scriptures. God was not against women. Jesus came in. One of the first things he did in his ministry was promote women. Amen. I'm going to move on. I'm doing this out of the New Living Translation. I think it's the best for these three verses that I'm using. If you've got a problem with that. Uh, send Kay an email. <laughs> Verse 10, a final word. This is the end of Ephesians. Ephesians is probably one of my favorite books. Of my <laughs> okay, they're all my favorite. But Ephesians is like really, really my favorite. <laughs> Ephesians fixed me. Ephesians is an identity book. If you're struggling with your identity, read Ephesians. And when you get done, read Ephesians. And when you get done, read Ephesians. When you get done, read Ephesians. It is an identity book. It, the, he spends five chapters telling you who you are in Christ. And then he tops it off in six and gives us um, some, some practical applications and what that looks like as we roll it out into our life. Deals with kids not honoring their parents and how destructive that is and deals with uh, some marriage issues. And then right down here, he's like, a final word. Just so you know, like this, this is it. This is the conclusion of his message. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In the King James, in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Those two people that got amens, they're tracking. But, so we are fighting. Because there's some people that don't. Like, they just, they're goofing off. Sitting on the couch eating Doritos, watching their favorite Netflix. They're dead. We, cannon fodder. But against evil rulers, one. Authorities of the unseen world, Two, that's one of my favorite parts of the NLT use, doing this version, is the unseen world. Not the unreal world. It's not the imaginary world. It's just unseen. The unseen world, mighty powers in this dark world, and evil spirits in the heavenly places. So this is kind of a delineation or a hierarchy of things that are happening in the spirit world. If you remember, last time, there was something that was uniquely missing from this list that, that, sh that rattled me when I realized it, and it was demons. Where's the demons? Because we're fighting against demons, right? I mean, that's our major spiritual fight. <laughs> They're not even listed. They're not even... They're not even on the agenda for today. This is what we're wrestling against. Demons are just like road bumps that get in our way. Oh, you got a demon? Oh! Yep. So anyway, how are you? <laughs> Work on your soul? Get your soul into prosperity? You know, yep, yep, okay, good. Praise God. And instead, you got people that have made entire ministries out of... Uh, <laughs> I, I heard that moan. <laughs> There's entire deliverance ministries that go around literally putting on display demonic activity, trying to get people all excited about them. When we were kids, um, me and my little brother, when we were kids, they used to play this stuff in the cult, and they would play tapes. They'd play recordings of people exercising demons, and they'd talk to them for an hour ask them their names and they'd change their voices and they'd be all freaky and they'd say terrible stuff. I'm going to get you in your sleep. And, and me and Tim, I was probably six years old. He's probably four, maybe, maybe seven and five. 
we literally would hide underneath the pews because we would be so freaked out. We'd be listening to these demon voices and they'd be like, you need to know this stuff. And so when I grew up and got, <laughs> got redeemed and I, and I learned one of these lessons, I'm going to show you where I learned one of these lessons. When I learned one of these lessons that we have authority over demons, I was like, wait, what? What? So my whole life, I've been freaked out by this evil spiritual world that has no right, no power, no authority in my life? Boy, wait till I find that preacher that lied to me. Amen. The, most of the problems that are in our lives are re, of a religious root. If you didn't know a ripping thing about anything spiritual, nothing. If you literally stumbled in here from the woke world and you just wanted to be unwoke, you know I could get you past 90% of this church in one year if you'll just come be a disciple. One year. Guarantee you. You will be flying the spiritual jet while everybody's in their Model T like, okay, I'm going to catch them. They cranked them up. Never mind. <laughs> Back up to verse 10, please, Mitch. His mighty power. This is kratos in the Greek. This is where we get the word kraken. This is the exact same word, the Greek word that was used in Ephesians 1.20 that says that this was the power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. So we're not just talking about you know, a, a little dabble, do you? Like energize, Energizer Bunny. We're talking the power from heaven that came and resurrected the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is some legit spiritual power. And so it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In Steve's mighty power, I can turn a bolt. I can pick up this whole laptop. In my mighty power, I can do some stuff. And you know, there isn't a single demon on this earth that seen me pick up that laptop and they go, whoo, better not mess with him. Did you see what he did with that laptop? They're just back on up. He picked up that laptop like he had some whoo. Anything that you exalt about your flesh, your intellect, doesn't cause a single ripple in the spirit world. And this is why a ton of people are enslaved by these spiritual principalities because they're trying to fight in their power and, those, and your, your spiritual enemies are like, oh, okay. So you're going to bring a pea shooter right in the middle of this nuclear war. <laughs> Just come on in, cutie. <laughs> right. And then on Sunday, you drag yourself into church. I need some prayer. Why? I had this pea shooter, and he showed up with a bazooka. <laughs> Why'd you do that? Because that's what my great grandma did, and my grandma, and my mom. Okay, well, see you next Sunday. Because that's the cycle we do. We know it doesn't work, and yet we still do it. This is the power of me versus the power of he. Now, you need the power of me. You, someone has to have the energy to stick a fork in your food and put energy in your mouth so your body can process it so that you can go out in your body and wage spiritual warfare against the enemy of mankind. So your body is important. Amen? Amen. amen. Well, my wife, did she say amen? Your body's important. <laughs> hey, hey. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Amen. 
We're succinct. Your body is important for the purpose of accomplishing the spiritual goals. This is one of the reasons that, you're, that some of you struggle in your health, in your physical health, because you don't know the purpose of your body. <laughs> it's not some toy that God gave you when you were born. You're actually supposed to take care of it. Amen. I'm, I'm going to do a class with some people that asked me um, to help them get their bodies to line up. And so in the near future, I'm going to be doing a class. And it, the whole f- three, uh, two-thirds of the class is going to be on spiritual principles because y- you know three-quarters of the word diet is die. Amen. Anybody know that? Did I just like freak you out? Whenever I hear somebody say, well, I'm on a diet. Well, you're three-quarters dead. <laughs> you're not going to lose weight and maintain proper proper weight health by a diet you're going to die for a while and then you're going to catch up right. and usually when you catch up that catching up usually makes you over catch up right, right? it's like you're accelerating i got to get caught up you accelerate like weird oops there's an extra 5 pounds diet is not going to fix you You have to deal with these things spiritually. You probably got to the place that you are physically because of spiritual or soulish roots. You can't fix spirit or soul with the flesh. (laughs) Thank you. I agree. I'll make a note. Verse 11. (laughs) Verse, Verse 11. God's armor creates the firm stance against. It's his armor. You put on his armor. You don't put on your armor that he made. This is important. You put on his armor. The reason reason that it's vital for you to have a revelation of that because when you face any of your enemies, they don't see you in armor made by God. They see God's armor. They don't know whether that's you or Jesus under there. And let me give you a secret. Don't tell them. They remember Epic Duomai. They remember that parade in hell 2,000 years ago. They remember when Jesus came down there and kicked their sorry butts all over the place. And here's maybe Jesus standing there in the exact same armor. They're not going to be so quick to pick a fight. It's his armor. It also means it works the way that he designed it to work. (laughs) You can take your car and pretend that it's a hammer. It's not going to be very advantageous for you the next time you need to go somewhere. God's armor works the way God's armor works. You you don't get to manipulate God into doing things with his armor that you want it to do. You don't get to go out and act a fool in his armor. If you're going to go out and act a fool, you're going naked. You're going naked. And the enemy is really, really excited, mouth drooling over naked enemies. Because you are easy to devour. (laughs) The enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Have you ever tried to eat steel? Don't do it. (laughs) You can't. Neither can the enemy. Stay in the armor. Against, this word, uh, stand firm against, is the word pros. It means to to operate in a face-to-face or eyeball-to-eyeball position. So you're not standing against the enemy under him when you're in the armor. You're not standing against the enemy over him. You are standing as a spiritual equal against the enemy when you're in God's armor. When you're not, he'll own you. 
And I'm not trying to, to beef up the devil or Satan or your enemy. Or, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to tell you that for 6,000 years, he has had an immense amount of fruit destroying people. And you're not going to be the first one that's going to stand up against him in your flesh, in your intellect, and in all of your personal strength and say, all right, devil, me and you, let's go. You're not going to be the first. The only way to defeat him is in the armor that God has made for you to be in. Then you stand face to face. Now you're a spiritual equal with all of the enemies that are coming against you. And for those of you that freaked out with the whole equal, the only way that you can do the kind of combat that you need to do to be victorious is to be at the same level. Yeah. Don't let it mess with you. We're going to get into some better stuff here in a minute. The next word there is strategies. And notice it's all. Anybody know what all means in the Greek? All. The word strategies is metados. Meta, dos. You might know meta because this is where we get metamorphosis. Meta means to change. Metanoe is the Greek word for repent. Repent actually has change in it. You have not repented because you said you're sorry. You're not even repentant if you say that you're really sorry, guilty, shamed, condemned over all the stuff that you did. That's not, ain't none of that repentance. Congratulations, you're convicted or condemned from the enemy, but repentance is actually going into that stuff and undo. That's why the that's why Jesus said you have to go to your brother and and get and give him an apology, because that is part of the change. Because in that apology, what you just did was you just punched self-centeredness in the face, and self-centeredness is what got you into the offense in the first place. Only by pride comes contentions. Proverbs 13, 10. You cannot get into a fight with someone unless you have pride. And so the way that you have to get back out of that is that you have to deal with pride. When you go to your brother or your sister and you apologize in sincerity, what you're doing is dealing with that pride. And pride don't like it. It'll rise up like, no, it's really their fault. I'm sorry, you're such a jerk. And I responded to your jerkness. Not repentance, not an apology. <laughs> the strategies, meta dose, meta change, completely change, not just change a little. Meta no way, repentance is to change from one to the other. It means you were walking this way and then you meta this way. Meta dose, the word dose in the Greek is the word for road. So the strategy of the enemy is to continually change your road. To, to make all the direct, every time you start headed away is to give you something. And then this person comes along and, oh, I got a different job offer. And, oh, and look at how hot she is compared to my wife. And, and oh, and this, this looks exciting. Oh, look at the flashing thing that just showed up on my phone. Hey, I know we're in a really deep conversation, but my phone's vibrating. Hold on. You don't mean as much to me as the telemarketer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the road continually changing. Confusion. Chaos. The more chaotic... The more confusion that's in your life, the more you are under the influence of the strategies of the enemy. Man, I, tell you, I just lit up a bunch of people's lights right there. Confusion is not from God. Amen. Chaos is not from God. Any confusion, any chaos in your life is from the enemy, and the problem is, is that most of us are affected deeply by it, and we spend all week in confusion and chaos, and then we wonder why we're not having the fruits of the Spirit and the benefits of the blessings of God operate in our life. The enemy's strategies are working well. Verse 12, please, Mitch. We are the fighters, please note. We are not fighting. We, not you. 
some of, some of you will get that in a minute. Next week, when you watch this on YouTube, this will sink in. It, this is a we fight, not a you fight. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when you go out there, you go out there and you wage your battle by yourself. It hurts our heart because here we are standing in the line that our commander wants us to stand in as a platoon waiting for the orders to go and do what our commander in chief needs us to do and you go running out there and turn yourself into machine gun target practice all by yourself because you're really excited right now. Praise and worship got you worked up and you're going to go out there. And do. This is a we fight. Those poor folks that think that home church with them and their wife and their two kids or three kids. They got to have three kids because you need the fivefold. So you got pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher. <laughs> Little Johnny, you're the apostle. <laughs> okay, dad. If there's no we... It, you're not waging the fight the way that your father, your, your high king yep. desires for you to do. That's why community, everything in the scriptures, please go read the Old Testament one time and see what God didn't want to do outside of community. I want you all to live together. I want you to live in tents. I want you to live in cities. I want you to meet together. I want you to have seven feasts. I want you to go to the temple all the time. I want you to have community. I want you to not go to the other, the other nations and worship their gods and take part with their people and go and get their money and do their economic. I want you to be a family and completely accomplish. I just talked about this on Wednesday night. Um, there are people in this in this room right now that have businesses that you might not even know about. If you are getting your car fixed by anybody besides Scott, Scott Downs, please tell me why. Is it convenience? Is it money? This, this, is, this is really good. Like, I'm, Scott didn't put me up to this. I get no kickbacks from this. <laughs> In fact, I might make it worse. Sorry. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know that somebody in your family who's literally helping the kingdom of God be healthy and grow and accomplish things and, and they are providing a service or a product that you use and you're not going to them, why? Why? Because you want the people out there that love Satan to have your money? Uh, and, and it's not just Scott. And here's the thing. Some of you don't even know. We have people in this, in this building that own small businesses that provide uh, cleaning chemicals, that own small businesses that provide for nutrient, uh, personal nutrients. We have people in this building that provide, uh, that cut hair, people that own restaurants, people that... Yeah. In this room, in this building, and some of you didn't even know that these things exist. Because we're not actually the community that we think we are. Every time I say, hey, beloved church is really awesome, you're like, yeah, that's me. I'm the awesome one. <laughs> Do you know any of these things? Do you know who these people are? Do you go to them and make sure that your money in those places gets spent with them? We're not as communal as we think we are. We're not as much we as we are, well, I'm going to do what's easy for me. Oh, it's for you. Remember the power of he, not me. We are the fighters. In this, I'm going to bring up the big D devil. But please note, it is not, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is in verse 11. I'm sorry, my bad. Uh, back up one, please, Mitch. Big D devil, notice it's not a big D. In most Christians' lives, it is. A lot of Christians 
have more of the big D devil and the big S Satan's name on their lips than they do the big C Christ. Amen. You know what the devil did to me? No, and I don't care. <laughs> you know what Satan did to my family? No. You know what God did for your family? Amen. You can be bitter or better. You can talk about Satan or you can talk about your Savior. Whatever you focus on, you become. I'm not saying anybody in here is demonic, devilish, or satanic. It's all those YouTube people out there. <laughs> Nobody in here focuses on the enemy and what he's doing in their life. And, and they're sorrowful and they're depressed and they're oppressed because they're completely focused on the devil. And they don't realize it that everybody else looking at them like, man, that person. It's a small d because it's a job description. <laughs> Devil is Diablos. Dia, uh, dia and uh, balo. Dia and balo. Balo means to throw. Dia means repetitively. The, the word for uh, Diablos is literally the accuser. So what Diablos does when they show when he shows up in the form of somebody in your life remember when Jesus told Peter get behind me devil Why Cuz the devil was secretly hiding behind Peter like hey can't see me No because Peter was operating in satanic activity <laughs> Oh boy it's going to take you deeper. You can be born again and operate in satanic stuff. Some of you are looking at me in satanic ways right now. <laughs> Satan is accuser. The devil is an accuser. He is a, Satan is adversary and devil is accuser. And that's why in, especially in the Old Testament, it's always small d and small s. In Hebrew, it's hasatan which means the Satan, the Satan. You know, I'm not the Steve, right? Okay, come on. This is definite article. Those of you that went to school remember English class. There's indefinite articles and definite articles. A definite article, the, points definitely to something. And it's the noun, and in this case, if it's, a, if it's an improper noun, lowercase, what it literally is talking about is a job function. So I'm not the Steve, but I am the pastor. Amen. Amen. Everybody just went to the ark. <laughs> so if there was 10 pastors up here, you could say, hey, that's Steve... My pastor. Now, you've identified me out of the crowd. So, nearly every time that the word devil and Satan is used in scriptures, it's the devil, or it has, in the Old Testament, it has that, in, that definite article attached to it, the Satan, ha Satan, the devil. It's literally talking about a job function. Devil means accuser. And Satan means adversary. So the accuser. You know, sometimes the accuser is your spouse. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. That's how you get in trouble. <laughs> it could be your spouse. They could be accusing you. Now, I'm not saying don't call your spouse. You are the devil. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But the activity of what they're doing is devilish the activity of what some people are doing by being your adversary you know the biggest adversaries that I've had in the ministry are Christians if it was not for Christians we would be 10 times the size have 10 times the amount of, of reach exposure be doing 10 times the number of things if it wasn't for Christians the world basically kind of ignores us until I sue the government, then they wake up for a minute, but then they go back to sleep because that's what they do. It's the Christians. 
Ask Jess how many of the calls, how many of the emails, how many of the, of the messages that we got. 98% of all the messages that we got when we were suing the government were Christians and pastors cussing us out. Satan. Satan. And I, and I know you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not going to be the, I have never been, nor am I ever going to be the person being used by the devil or Satan. Aren't you cute? <laughs> Not you. You're the perfect one. You just floated down here, your little fat naked baby with your wings, and you're just plucking people with your little love bow. No, sometimes we get utilized by the wrong, <laughs> by the wrong kingdom in people's lives. This is the bad part. It's not so bad that every once in a while you get tricked or deceived by the strategies of the enemy to get used by the wrong company. Here's the bad part. When you justify yourself and continuing to do it because you would never be used by the kingdom of darkness, so therefore what you're doing is right. You're so far beyond correction. You're so far beyond, you don't even have anybody you're submitted to. So how can anybody tell you that you're wrong? I don't need none of that discipleship stuff. Just me and Jesus. Notice this Satan in Mark 4.15. I'm going to prove to you that it's not necessarily a singularity of an, of an entity, but it's more spiritual entities that are being operated by the kingdom of darkness. Mark 4.15 says, and if you remember this, this is Jesus' famous parable on the sower sows the word. And then he, he said, you know, G, the sower sows word all over, and then there's four different grounds. And in, and in the wayside ground, Mark 4.15, it says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So if you believe that Satan is a singularity of an entity, that means he can only steal the word out of one person's heart every Sunday, out of a billion people in church, which means the rest of us are good. Either that or the parable that Jesus taught us means that the Satan, the adversary, can come and steal the word out of people's hearts all over the world, all over the churches, anywhere, anytime, when they have a loose heart. If there's one adversary, only one person is going to get stolen from, right? right. Are, are we all following me? I think I feel like I'm losing you. Back to verse 12, Ephesians 6, 12. In the word fighting, it says, uh, for we are not fighting. That word fighting is uh, pele, P-A-L-E with the little thingy over top of it. And this is the word in Greek that literally meant boxing or wrestling or fighting. It could be any different number of ways that they would fight. And when they fought, they fought to the death. This, you, you are probably aware that, you know, in the great coliseums, in these games that they would date, the, who, what was the movie with the dude? Gladiator. The gladiator games. This is what they would do. They would pele. They, they weren't fighting for funsies. They weren't wrestling around with, you know, their, their, their brother because they were bored after Thanksgiving meal. They were, they were fighting for a purpose. And a lot of us don't necessarily fight for a purpose. Remember, Paul says, I don't fight like a guy that's beat in the air. In other words, he's just not practicing out there like, look at me go. I'm sweating hard. Yeah, you are. Who? look at it. All my muscles are tense. Yep, look at that. Oh, look at how many times the bag moved. Yeah, I'm impressed. I really did something. No, you really didn't. You really didn't. And this is a ton of believers today. They're working hard. They're sweating. They're doing a lot. They're checking boxes. They're getting it done. So what did you accomplish? Well, look at all the stuff I did. None of it matters. 
You just beat the air for three days solid. Is there any fruit? Is there any fruit? Ask yourself that all the time. I think about this all the time. This is why some people don't get the same... And I, no, I just stepped off in it. There are, there are people that I don't give the same amount of attention to as I do other people because the words and the time that I give those people are not fruitful. They don't bear fruit. And I don't give people different words. I don't meet with... Uh, I, when I'm with Kay, I give her the best of me. When I'm with Mom, I give her the best of me. When I'm with my daughter, when I'm with, when I'm with you, I'm giving you my best. And if that goes into you and you turn it into the little seeds that come out and hit you on the head from the bird then I'm not going to go and give you the best of me anymore. If you're not going to value me, if you're not going to value my words, if you're not going to value my input, then why would I do it? Go to the people that you value. It ain't me. That's fine. I'm not hurt. I'm just saying, how many times people have come to me and are like, well, why don't you meet with me? Because the last time I met with you, the last 12 times I met with you, you did nothing with what I gave you. Why would I take that hour and a half and listen to you complain about all the terrible things in your life when I could take that hour and a half and give it to Bob and he's going to value it and love me and appreciate it and put it into work in his life and bear much fruit? This isn't just a Steve thing. This should be a you thing. How many people in your life are just taking from you without bearing any of the fruit? Don't do that. You're valuable. Your words are valuable. Your time is valuable. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. Every time we wrestle with flesh, we are fighting the wrong enemy. I wish Ryan would act right. I'm going to... Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to manipulate him. I'm going to send him this text message, and he's going to get it. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this because Ryan needs to get right. You know, you know how many people did that this week? It ain't Ryan. Ryan is either following after the things that are coming from his father, or he is being tempted and deceived by the enemy. If you want to help Ryan, do air warfare. Father, I thank you that Ryan hears from you. I thank you that he listens to your spirit. God, I thank you that you're sending laborers across his path that are telling him the truth and that he is not having, he's not crossing paths with his adversaries, Satan's, and he's not crossing paths with the people that are indicting him and trying to condemn him or accuse him, devil. It's amazing. When you start praying for somebody with a pure real heart of love it is really hard to be angry at them the Lord taught me this lesson we had a church split a bunch of years ago and the Lord said I need to pray for the person that split the church and I said get thee behind no (laughs) said fine I'll pray for them God I pray they don't die today in a fiery car wreck (laughs) Jesus and then the next day God, I pray they don't, they don't die. And then the next day, God, I pray that, I don't know, they live like all week. <laughs> and then the next day, I stayed diligent to it because I know that God needed me to do it. And what I found out was over time, I actually started praying for them. And then something happened to my heart. Right. Yeah. And my enemy wasn't flesh and blood. And then I started seeing that person in the spirit and I started seeing the things that were influencing them, the things that were tearing them down, the things that were affecting their identity and the things that happened to them when they were young. And then I started having compassion. I have it right now. And now that person is not doing well. And I wonder if it wasn't the way that I was cursing them with my thoughts right after what they did to me. How dare them do that to me as if I'm something special. 
as if I'm the first person in America that's had a church split. Jesus had a church split. Judas. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. The first hierarchical is evil rulers in this list. And this is the Greek word arches. This is where we get archangel. So this means the highest of that form of spiritual being. And I don't want to get into all of this. You can go check out Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, Psalm 89, um, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11. If you put all that together, you'll figure out that there were other Elohims, little g gods besides big g God. And these little g gods have been running amok, causing terrible damage all over the planet for quite some time. It's one of the reasons that Jesus had to come as the big G God onto the physical planet was to rectify things that had gone wrong. So I'm not going to get into all the depth of that. If you, want to, if you want to do a deep dive on that, I can point you to some stuff. But here's the reality. There are evil rulers. There are spiritual entities that are of the God kind, Elohim, who are doing terrible things on this planet. We're not smart enough to come up with some of the evil that we do. There is no way humans came up with killing their own children, sacrificing them to gods. We were taught that. If you don't believe me, do kids' church or go to a school and figure out that children are not born racist. You have to teach a child racism to make them a racist. You can't, there no such thing as a kid born gay, born racist, born a thief. No such thing. Those things are taught. Some of them have been taught by these spiritual entities. So what are we going to do? Oh my God, there's terrible spiritual entities teaching us bad stuff. Here's what you do. When you give your full devotion, your complete allegiance to Jesus and the spirit that teaches us, then you are fighting against this power. Every time you teach, every time you learn, you are fighting against that entity. And you make null and void an entire aspect of the kingdom of darkness. This is why we do this, is to teach, to train, so that his works are not effective in your life. The next one is the authorities of the unseen realm. This is the Greek word exousia. You probably know this one. This is the word for authority. It's specifically delegated authority. God is the only one that has natural authority. Amen? Everything else under God is delegated. And people misuse their delegation. Amen? Anybody ever seen a bad pastor who spiritually abused people and wanted their money and took advantage of people? Yeah? He had spiritual authority that was delegated to him by heaven and he misused it and hurt people. Same thing with spiritual entities. What do we do about that? When we proclaim the gospel, the good news, in word and deed, in word and deed, St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel always and if necessary, use words. When we proclaim the gospel, the good news in word and deed, we combat this power. The way that you take down realm two is by living and proclaiming the gospel. The third one, mighty powers in this dark word is cosmocrator, cosmocrator, cosmo, cosmos, and crator. That's the word that we used at the beginning, power. So this is power that is operational in the cosmos, in the whole known universe. One of these, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of this. The second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. The law, <laughs> I got, a, got an up thumb from our, uh, from our science teacher. Th- this is the law of decay. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you build a brand new house that's perfect and you come back 200 years later, it'll just fall down. Nobody touched it, nobody blew it up, nobody, it just, what happened? It decayed. This is rust. 
This, this is the natural state of our world. Everything in, this state is go, everything in this world is going from order to disorder. From God's order to chaos. There are chaos agents that are operating to bring chaos into this world. To bring uh, decay. To bring the destruction of things that were once right. Does anybody in this place ever have a victory and, and, and have some personal uh, accomplishments in your life? And then you had to redo some of that stuff a couple years later? Why? Because things degenerate. You know, I have to, on purpose, be married to Kay every day. I don't just say, well, we got married 28 years ago at an altar. I said I loved you then. If, if something changes, I'll let you know. No, I have to do love today. I have to on purpose stop this chaos, this, uh, this breaking down and this decay that's taking place. So what, how do we combat this? When we put things in God's order, this is God, why God wants your marriage in his order. This is why God wants this church in his order. This is why God wants your life in his order. This is why God wants your family in his order. Because if it's in his order, then it can't be decayed and have chaos take place. <laughs> Putting things in your world in his order is how you combat this power. And the last one, the highest one, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is pneumaticos ponerios. And the word ponerios is where we get the English word porn which literally just means everything that is wicked and evil. Isn't it interesting that the Greek language literally says that porn is a, a combination of all evil, wicked, twisted things. And we pay for it. Pneumaticos is, you hear the word pneumatic in there, which is pneuma, which is breath. When you get pneumonia, it affects your breath. Pneuma is spirit in the Greek. Pneuma and breath are the same thing. So when you put all this together, you're talking about the spirit, the wind, the breath, as the origin conjoined to the poneria, which is the evil, and wicked pain resulting in toil and misery. So this is the winds and the breaths that are blowing over this world from the kingdom of darkness that are trying to put breath in your lungs. They are trying to take the breath of life out of you and put the breath of death into you. This is a force that affects every person on this planet. As long as you're on this planet, you're going to be affected by this force. What are we to do? When we use the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. This is the pneuma of God. In the Hebrew, it's the ruach. This is the Spirit of God, the breath of God. This is what he put into Adam. It says he breathed in him the breath of life. This is God putting himself into you. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you are born again, the spirit of Christ, the breath of Christ comes into your life, invades what was once dead, and brings in the breath of the author of life, and you become a living soul. When you operate your life by the spirit, then you are not under the influence of what is happening by the breath of death that's taking place in the flesh. Amen. I'm going to show you that all of these principles in operation in three verses. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18. Jesus came to them. This is the Great Commission and said, All, anybody know what all means in Greek? All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It was given to him, delegated. Therefore, go and make disciples. A disciple is a fully, completely devoted, allegiant one. Not go make converts. Not go make pew warmers. Not go make people that go to church on Sunday. Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is God re-imaging his people. A disciple is a re-imager. It's an image of God. That's why discipleship is necessary because it transforms you back into the image that God intended for you to be. Verse 20, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Anybody know what all means in the Greek? All. <clears throat> so let me show you this. 
In verse 19, it says, make disciples. That means complete allegiance. That's how you defeat the first entity. And uh, in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, this is the re-imaging. That's how you defeat the second entity. When you re-image God, when we are God's imagers and we walk through this earth as vessels of light, as salt on this earth, then you are destroying that second uh, hierarchical position of the enemy. And then the third one, verse 20, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. That means you're putting things in God's order. You're bringing order to chaos. If you're listening to what he commanded you, then you are putting things in his order from the chaos that it once was. And then the last thing, surely I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Who's I? The Spirit of God. The breath of God is with you until the end of the age. Now in one minute, <coughs> I'm going to show you one of the greatest truths that I ever had. And then I can't do the other part. So those of you that got the notes, congratulations, you got a bonus. Matthew chapter 8, I'm going to read through this. When Jesus had enter in, entered into Capernaum, a centurion came and pleaded with him. A centurion. There was literally nobody higher in natural authority in the earth except for a king than a centurion. This was the highest form of authority that existed in this world. A centurion came and pleaded with him, Jesus. Lord, my servant lies at home, paralyzed and in terrible agony. Jesus replied, I will go and heal him. Eight, the centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. Not scream. Not, not kick and fuss and not flex and just say the word. And the word word is logos. Just say the logic of heaven. Logos. And my servant will be healed. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Man, what did God? We just had that much understanding of how things worked. Oh, if God says it, it'll happen. For I myself am a man under authority. Please note under with soldiers under me. Please note under. I tell one to go and he goes and another to come and he comes. I tell my servant to do something and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. He said, this is the greatest faith that he ever, ever saw in Israel. Listen to me. Ever saw in Israel, you do know that Jesus knew Israel before there were, when it was Jacob. <laughs> he said, this is the greatest faith that Jesus ever seen out of the entire nation of Israel from its conception. And he wasn't even Israeli. Right. What did he see? Submission. You missed it because you say, well, he was a centurion. He'd tell people to do stuff. And so he, he's seen Jesus and he, Jesus tells something. He understood the authority that Jesus had, the delegated authority that Jesus had because he was under submission. He learned authority through submission. It's the only way you learn authority. It's the only way you learn authority. Those bosses that you hate because they're terrible bosses, the reason they're terrible bosses is because they never learn submission. You cannot have divine authority. You cannot have delegated authority from heaven until you first learn submission. When you learn submission to its end, you will have divine understanding of authority and you can say to Jesus, you're the highest of authority, all power, all authority in heaven and in earth is yours. You say the word, it's going to happen. Until you understand submission, you'll never understand authority. Amen. What determines your success is not who you are over, but it's who you're under. Amen. All right. I'm out of time. I'm not out of notes, but I'm out of time. <clears throat> Heroes operate in divine delegated authority through humility, submission, and courage. Please rise, mighty heroes.
now please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.